does, eh? I mean, seriously, every time he sees an elf that he doesn't think is fit for the job of making presents, he just chucks them out to fend for themselves. Take me, for example. I've been chucked out, and I went from riches to rags, quite the opposite of usual stories. Look, I've only got these. That's all I've got. This rag and this hat. I mean, seriously, everyone thinks it's all fun and happiness when you work for Santa Claus. But honestly, it's not that fun. You just work all day and you work all night. He doesn't even let you get take any of his candy. You know, I'm actually quite lucky that I got chucked out because it means that I can do whatever I want. I can go fishing, I can go surfing, I can play polar bears. I, I can eat as much candy as I want, but they... They should be liberated. I think I'm going to call up a ton of my outcast elf friends and I'm going to go in and save all the elves. I mean, you, who cares about those pesky humans with all their demands for presents? I think the elves should have rights too. The elves should be able to be free. So yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to free the elves. We do a few rehearsals with my mother as the Virgin Mary and I'm supposed to get emotional when Jesus is dying on the cross and he says to Mary, woman, behold your son while looking over at me. And I'm supposed to break down at that point because I know that Jesus is about to croak it, but basically I'm getting really nervous because basically I'm a terrible actor and I'm all blocked up. Right. So I tell my mother I want to drop out of the play. I say it quiet so the others can't hear. But she starts screaming at me and saying how typical it was. Did I have a backbone? And why was I such a coward? And why wasn't I like all my older brothers? All that stuff. <laughs> then she says I'm like my dad. <laughs> what would I know? I haven't seen my dad since I was six. But she starts screaming, you're just like your dad, Jim. Just like your dad, walking out on things, walking out on me, gutless. I mean, I hate her just then. Why'd she have to bring up my dad in front of all those people like that? Why? So, I get in, Miss Pat and my aunt. Mrs. Beavis. As a rotten coat on. Couldn't wait to get off those lazy little. She told me that Bernard's been propped up in a chair in front of the TV all evening. She helped me get him up the stairs and, uh, as per the dear little cover of programme, I sat by the bed and I gave him all my news. Mr Clarkson Hall, down at the unit, says that when someone has suffered a cerebral accident, in lay terms, a stroke, Miss Fossard, we must be very careful not to treat them like a child. If you want your brother to recover his faculties, the more language you can throw at him, the better. <laughs> it don't really matter what you say, as long as it's language. So, uh, I was just recounting to him a conversation with Joyce Bickleswaite about the village caroling, and suddenly, Bernard throws back his head and yawns. <gasps> I, I rang Mr Clarkson Hall this morning. He says it, it's progress. <laughs> Just in time for Christmas. Oh, my phone to my ear. It ringing. Hear it stop. I ring again. It stops. I ring again. It stops. I ring again. It stops. I keep ringing and ringing and ringing and screaming inside my head. I'm screaming, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Mike's in hospital. Mike's in hospital and he's... 
You don't care. Do you? You don't care, you coward! You are. You're a goddamn coward, you! Mom needs you to be better. Where are you? And I'm screaming this and I'm screaming this over and over again, and he... Hello. No, I can, I can hear you. I... Mike's in hospital, he's... What do you mean? No. Yeah. No, he's in hospital, he's... What do you mean? Are you coming? Why not? Dad. Don't say that. No, Dad, please. Dad, don't say that. Dad! No. Just... Just get here. Please. Dad. Dad! Don't! Dad, I know you can hear me. I know you can. Where are, are you? Dad. 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 Silence. I can't believe how unlucky I am to have my birthday on Christmas Day. Of all the days in the year, there are 364 other days to have your birthday on. But no, my parents decided to bring me into the world on Christmas Day. A day where everyone's too busy stuffing their faces with turkey, ripping open Christmas presents, falling asleep in front of a TV and pulling crackers. It's not really the best day for people to celebrate someone's birthday. Not when there's so much interesting stuff to do. Don't even get me started on the time my best friend decided to get me a book, half wrapped in Christmas wrapping paper and half wrapped in birthday wrapping paper. You won't believe how many times my parents have forgot to got me a birthday cake. But just a lit match in a mince pie it doesn't really do it for me. And on top of that, I've never had a birthday party because my friends are too busy celebrating with their own families. It's the worst. My mum should have thought about what she was putting me through. She should have just held me in for a, a few hours. Just, just one minute before midnight. Then, then I could have the 26th of December all to myself. That would be nice. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York, and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious reeds, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarums changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious policing of a lute. But I that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking-glass. I, that am rudely stamped, and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Why I, in this weak piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, unless to spy my shadow in the sun and descant on mine own deformity, and, therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain, and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous by drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams, to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate the one against the other. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous, this day should Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy, 
which says that G of Edward's heirs, the murderer, shall be. Dive thoughts down to my soul. Here Clarence comes. Oh my, oh my, I'm all in a tizzy, let me tell you. I've finally been given a job, a real life make-a-wish job, and I can't find my wand. That's been happening a lot lately. I think all this spell-making has rewired my brain. Yesterday, I turned my cat into a frog. <sighs> Ever seen a frog meow? It's quite disturbing, let me tell you. Besides, what's a fairy godmother got to do without her wand? I can't whiz up a hairdo or a beautiful gown. And I haven't sewn a day in my life. And I can't pack Cinderella on my back. Oh, this just won't do. Here, little wand. Here, little wand. <laughs> if only I'd turn my cat into a dog, then she could fetch it for me. I might get demoted to Tooth Fairy. Oh, no. I want to turn Christmas trees into crackers, not collect dirty, rotten teeth. I need to find it fast. I know, I'll check the freezer. I think a lot about what makes people do things, what makes us behave in certain ways, you know? Every night I've been thinking about this and trapped in whatever behaviour, I don't know, cycles of violence or, or something. And is it possible to break these cycles? Is it actually possible? And anyway, I'm just sat here thinking about this and this cat, this gorgeous cat with no tail comes at my back door and you see the back door's open because the garden, well, it just looks so... And anyway, so the cat, she, she seems so frightened. She seemed terrified at first. And the garden, it's so, so beautiful. And anyway, so I go and I bring her some food. And, and um, well, the first time she just sniffs at it and runs away the moment I move. You know, no sign of her for the rest of the night. And I'm thinking, reactions, responses, patterns, violence breeding violence. And anyway, she's in the next night. She's in a bit further and I'm looking at her tail and I'm thinking, that's been cut off. I, I don't think it has. I think, I think she's a Manx, they're born without tails. And she's in the next night. And I'm beginning to get used to this. She's in further and I'm beginning to even look forward to it. And she's in the next night and she's eating. And from then on, she's in every night. She's on my lap, she's following me around, she's waiting on the window ledge for when I get home and, and we're sat there. And I'm thinking, behaviors, patterns, is it actually, is it actually possible to break these patterns of whatever and... Anyway, we're there every night and she's meowing to be let in and she's eating and... Every night. And one night, well, she, she just scratches me. Cats, you know, just a vindictive cat scratch. Hey, look. And... She known she'd done wrong. Took her three nights before she got back on my lap. And I'm just stroking her and thinking, warm, delicate, you know. And I put my hands around her neck and I squeeze and I squeeze and until her neck's about the thickness of a rope and still, Still, I'm squeezing it and I'm just sat there and you know this was last night and I'm sat there with this this dead cat in my lap and I just thought I'd come in and you know see you 
So here I am. About a week later, they started to come round and do this thing to the brain. We're all supposed to have it done in, in this ward, and, th and they came round and did it, one at a time, one a night. I was one of the last, so I could see quite clearly what they did to the others. They came round with these big, I don't know what they were, they, they, they looked like pincers with, with, with wires on, and the wires were attached to a little machine. And there was a man holding the machine, you'd see, and he'd turn it on, and, and this chief doctor would put the pincers onto either side of the man's skull and, and, and keep them there. Then they'd take them off and they'd cover the man back up and they wouldn't touch him until later on. Some used to put up a fire, but most of them didn't. They just laid there. But they were coming round to me, you see, and the night they came, I got up and I stood against the wall. And they told me to get on the bed, and, and, and I knew that they had to get me on the bed, because if they did it whilst I was standing up, they, they could break my spine. And so I got up, and, and one or two of them came for me. And, well, I was younger then, I, I, I was quite strong then. I, I laid one of them out, and, and I had the other by the throat, but, but suddenly the doctor had the pincers on my skull, and, and, and I knew he wasn't supposed to do it whilst I was standing up, but, but, but he did it anyway, and... Th th that's why... I So I got out, I got, I got out of that place, but I couldn't walk properly. I don't think my spine was damaged, that was quite alright. The thing is, m my thoughts had become very slow, I, I couldn't get my thoughts together. I, I couldn't look to the left or, or to the right, I, I had to look right in front of me because it, it, if I turned my head I, I, I couldn't keep up right. And I had these headaches, I'd go to my room. And I'd, I'd lay out all the things that I knew to be mine, but I didn't die. The thing is, I, I should have died. I, I should have been dead. But anyway, I feel much better now. I sometimes think about going back and finding the man that did that to me. But I want to do something first. I want to build that shed out in the garden. From my earliest youth I have understood that my nature is a mass of contradictions. I have, to begin with, a very romantic imagination. The practice of writing an important document, enclosing it in a bottle, sealing the latter and throwing it into the sea, is one that never failed to thrill me as a child reading all kinds of adventure stories. Mm. It's for that reason that I have chosen to adopt this course. Writing my confession. Concealing it in a bottle and casting it into the waves. I understand. There is a hundred to one chance that my message may be found. And in that case, or do I flatter myself? A hitherto unsolved murder mystery may be explained. I have other traits besides my romantic fancy. I have a definite sadistic delight in seeing or causing death. As a child, I remember experiments with wasps and various garden pests. Yes, from a young age, I knew very well the lust to kill. But side by side with this went a contradictory trait, a strong sense of justice. It is abhorrent to me that any person or creature should suffer or die by any act of mine. I have always believed very strongly that right should prevail. It may be understood, I think a psychologist would understand, that my mental makeup being what it was, I chose the law as a profession. The legal profession satisfied nearly all my instincts. Crime and its punishment have never failed to thrill me. I enjoy reading every kind of detective story and thriller. I have devised for nothing but my private entertainment the most ingenious way of carrying out murder. Why? Why did you do it? What did you gain by it? Answer me. Do you deny it's your handiwork? 
Well, aren't you going to speak? Well, I shall take your silence as a confession of guilt. Thank you for not wasting my time with infectious denials. At least you spare me that. Not that you lack the infantry to deny it. Let the blame fall on some innocent person. A selfish disregard for the well-being of others. Don't look out the window when I'm talking to you. Don't look on the ground. I suppose you think this silence makes you tough. You don't have to conform because you're special. You're too good for us. Well, you're not. I see them standing where you are. The no-hopers. The non-achievers. I read you like this book. Only it makes more sense than you do, even the dilapidated state you reduced it to. Some of our young people respect books. They want to learn. Now I shall have to lock the library when it's under unattended. Would be readers without to collect the key from my secretary. Everyone is punished because of you. Tell me this. Do you want to be happy? No, I don't think you do. It's too simple. You don't know why you destroyed this book. You don't know why you do anything. It's not only me you can't talk to. You can't talk to yourself. And that's why you'll end up destroying yourself. If this were a story, you'd end up running the school library. <laughs> Life isn't like that. No. Life is like... This book. Right, can't spare you any more time. Other people's have needs, things to attend to. I shall be writing to your parents. If you commit any further nuisance, you will be expelled. This is your final warning. I shall have to write you down as one of my failures. Please close the door as you go. Well, boys and girls, there's time for just one last story. Are you all sitting comfortably? Santa was furious. It was Christmas Eve and nothing was going right. Mrs. Claus had burnt the mince pies. The elves were complaining about not getting paid overtime and while well, the reindeer were distinctly squiffy. And to make matters worse, they'd taken the sleigh out for a spin earlier in the day and crashed it. Santa was furious. I can't believe it. I've got to deliver millions of presents all around the world in just a couple of hours. My elves are on strike. My reindeer are drunk. And I haven't even got a Christmas tree. I sent that stupid little angel out hours ago to find one and he isn't even back yet. What am I going to do? Just then, the front door opened and the little angel stepped in from the snowy night, dragging an enormous Christmas tree behind him. He says, If Atty, where do we stick the tree this year? And thus came to pass the tradition of the angel on top of the tree.